When I was young, I used to hang out with my cousins all the time. And there was one time when I was hanging out with my cousins, we were in the house and we decided to go outside. Well, on the back of our house, I had a, we had a sliding glass door. So we were inside and we decided to go out. Then we were outside for a little while, we decided to come in. Then for some reason, we decided we wanted to go back out again. And after being outside, I don't know how long, but we decided we wanted to come back inside again. And before the door could shut, I heard my dad call from across the room, in or out? <laughs> so we stood there and had to look at each other and make a decision. Are we going to be in or out? Which way are we going to go? We had to choose just one or the other. We couldn't do them both. We had to do one or the other, in or out. Well, when we read Mark, we see that same kind of challenge. Are you in or out? And how Mark is going to ask you, how are you going to respond to Jesus? That's the challenge he's putting before us. How are you going to respond to Jesus? And the thing is, you have to make a choice. You have to make a decision. Are you in or out? But what will you do? And you need to be careful when you make this choice because it is a big decision. But Mark started by telling us who Jesus is. He's the Son of God. He also showed us in the passages already in the, the few chapters that we've looked at, Actually, we're just in this third chapter, so two chapters and a few verses that we've looked at. He's already showed us that Jesus has supernatural power and authority. And Jesus' fame has grown. In fact, many have seen that supernatural power and authority firsthand. Because everyone's coming to see him and to hear him. And they see what he's doing. How he's been healing people and casting out demons. They've seen that power and authority firsthand. Well, today in the passage that we're going to look at here, we will see that there are different, uh, different groups of people who have different responses to Jesus. Some of them just outright reject Jesus. I mean, they are out. They don't like him. They don't like what he say. They are completely opposed to him. And they want nothing to do with him. And they really want no one else to have anything to do with him either. Then there are some who are, they're out, but they're not really sure what to think about Jesus. There's some that we would say are maybe in, but we don't really know. We can't tell for sure. And others who are all in and who want everyone else to be all in as well. And so we will see these groups. There are these four types of people. But the thing is that these four types of people still exist today. And so we'll see this and look at these, and we're going to start with the popular crowd. In verses 7 through 12, let's start with verses 7 and 8, chapter 3, verses 7 and 8. It says, Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the sea, and a great crowd followed him from Galilee and Judea, and Jerusalem and Idumea, and from beyond the Jordan, and from around Tyre and Sidon. When a, the great crowd heard all that he was doing, they came to him. So Jesus, if you remember in our passage from last week, Jesus had just stood up to the confrontation that was leveled against him by the Pharisees. When he was in the synagogue and there was a man with a withered hand who needed to be healed and they were watching to see what he would do. And then they got on him and they said, you shouldn't do that. You, you can't work on the Sabbath. And he said, is it right to do what is good on the Sabbath? To, to save life or to kill life? And they had this conversation. Well, Jesus did good on the Sabbath. And he healed that man. But now it was time for him to, to get away. And so he takes the disciples and they go out by the sea. And here he's talking about the Sea of Galilee, which is really just a really big lake. But he's out there by the lake, near the lake shore. And the reason why he went out there is because he wanted to find a neutral place. A place where there, you know, that he could, uh, there wouldn't be the opposition necessarily. There wouldn't be so many crowds and, and that kind of thing. But he could go out there and he could do his work and he could continue his ministry uh, and teach and heal a little more freely, a little more openly. But what happens when he goes out by the lake? Well, the people hear about it and they see him heading out to the lake and everyone follows him over there. They just get up and they go where he is. This huge crowd, start, huge crowd starts following him around. Now, when it says that they followed him, this isn't following the technical sense of like following Jesus, like they believed him or whatever. It just simply means that they're following him around, physically walking behind him. They're following him around. And so they see where he is and they go there too. 
Now, I want you to notice where these people are from. First of all, we are told that they're from Galilee. Well, this would be to be expected. There's no surprise there because Jesus is in Galilee and a lot of the ministry that he has done so far has been in Galilee. So no surprise people from Galilee are there. But he also says they came from Judea. Now, Judea is really the heart of Judaism. It's, I mean, Jerusalem is in that region, in Judea. And so there, people in, in the heart of Judaism have heard about Jesus and are starting to come out to see him and to see what he's saying. Then he mentions Idumea. Now, Idumea is the Greek word for Edom. And so this is the region that's just south of Judea, so all the way down at the bottom of Israel. These people are part of Israel, but they were also a little questionable by, by many Jews because they were, kind of, uh, um, they were kind of secular, I guess, in a little bit. A lot of the people who, who, who there, oh, let me give an example. Herod was from Idumea. And, you know, Herod was a friend of Rome. And so many of the people in Idumea were kind of friendly to Rome. And so some of the Jews were looked upon him with a little question. But anyways, but people from all the way down south have come. We're also told that people came from beyond the river. This is talking about the Jordan River. So people from the east side of the Jordan River have come. They've crossed the river and come over to see Jesus. And we're told that they came from Tyre and Sidon. Now, Tyre and Sidon are from way up here, the northern part of Galilee and along the coast of the Mediterranean. But not only that, but these are Gentile towns. And so you have people coming, even Gentiles, hearing about Jesus and coming to see Jesus. But we see here that people are coming from all directions and from far away to, to see Jesus. Now, I know some people or know of people who have done something similar to this. Someone who had a sickness or had some kind of issue and there was no treatment here in the United States for it, but Germany had a treatment. Maybe it was experimental, but they had treatment. So what did they do? Jumped on a plane, flew to Germany to get that treatment. That's what's happening here. People are hearing about Jesus. There's this guy over here who heals people. And so they're all traveling from far away to get to him, to see him, so they could be healed. And that's what it says here, that they heard all that he was doing, and they came. So you see, Jesus was famous. I mean, everybody, I mean, he's like a rock star. And everyone wants to get close to him and wants to see him. He's the guy who can heal you. He can do these great things. And so people are coming to see Jesus from everywhere. And, even, and, and everyone's talking about him. And then if you go and you get healed by Jesus, today people would take out their phones and take their selfies and say, look at me, I just got healed by Jesus. And they'd post it on Instagram or Twitter. And... This is what's happening. Everyone's coming to see him. Everyone wants to see Jesus. In fact, there were so many. Look what Jesus says in verse 9. It says, and he told his disciples to have a boat ready for him because of the crowd, lest they crush him. Now, you may ask, where'd they get a boat? Well, you remember some of these guys were fishermen, so it probably was their boat or a boat that belonged to their family. But he tells them, have this boat ready, because this is the point. There are a lot of people all around Jesus, and they seem to be mobbing him. He says, in case I need it so they don't crush me. They seem to be mobbing Jesus. They're press, pressing in. See, they can't wait to get close to him. They can't wait to see him. They can't wait to be healed by him. These people are anxious. Why? Well, look what he's doing. Verse 10 12, through 12. He says, for he, he had healed many so that all who had disease, diseases pressed around him to touch him. And whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God. And he strictly ordered them not to make him known. So Jesus has been healing people and casting out demons. And all these people have heard about it. They've heard that he can help them. And so they want him to help them. And so they're pressing into Jesus. And basically it's kind of like, let me at him. I got to get to him. I got to get there. And they're all pressing in around him. Now, Mark gives us a few additional notes about what's going on here. First of all, we, we, we see that demons are falling down before Jesus. And when they fall down before him, they're declaring who Jesus is. You see, the thing we notice here is that the demons know who Jesus is. They know who he is. They say, you are the son of God. 
They know who he is. And not only that, but they are falling down before him. They are submitting to Jesus. They know he has authority over them. They know his power. They know who he is. And so they're falling down before him and declaring who he is. They submit to Jesus because they have to. And when Jesus says, get out, they get out. They have to. The second thing is that Jesus tells those demons not to tell people who he is. So they start yelling, you're the son of God. And he says, be quiet. And this is the same reason we've been talking, we, we've seen before. He doesn't want people to go, oh, you're the Messiah? Oh, you're, and start making this big deal and make him, try and make him a political leader and try and get things worked up. And people start talking about, hey, there's a Messiah out there and he does these amazing things. And, and then Rome hears about it and Rome says, oh, we're going to go capture this guy because we don't need another revolutionary out there. And then they take him and they kill him and put him to death. Well, Jesus is going to be put to death, but he's going to do it in God's timing, not in Rome's timing and not in the Israelites' timing but in God's timing. So Jesus says, be quiet. But we also see that what the demons are saying about Jesus is true. He is the Son of God. And the third thing is the crowds. The way the crowds are thinking about Jesus and his healing is a little interesting. Because they say, I just, if we could just get close enough to touch him. And see, they're thinking is, if I only touch Jesus, if I can just get close enough to touch him, then I'll be healed. Well, that may or may not be true. But it's almost they have this attitude where they're almost thinking of something magical. Like, if I just get close enough for touch, then, then it'll be, rather than the fact that it's Jesus who is healing. But it's almost like superstitious, if you will. But they're thinking about Jesus. But they want to get to Jesus, and they can't get close, enough, or close to him fast enough. But this is why I call the people the popular crowd. Not because they're the popular people and everyone wants to be around them, but they're the crowd who wants to be near Jesus because he's popular. Okay, so they hear about Jesus and all that he's doing and they're running after him because he is popular and they want to be close to him and be healed by him. But here's the question. Are these people in or out? I Meaning, are they true believers in Jesus? Are they true followers of Jesus? Now, I'm sure I know that they believe Jesus can heal them. But are they followers of Jesus? Do they believe that he is the son of God? Do they believe that he is the one who's coming to save? I can't answer it. I don't know. We're told that they're swarming to him and they're following around him, but we don't really know. I'm sure some of them were and some of them weren't. Some of them were. Some of them were just coming to be healed. Some of them were coming just so what, for what Jesus could do for them, just so they could get his help not really to follow. And some of them may have simply been coming for a good show. Because, hey, there's this guy, I mean, everyone likes a magician, right? And some of them, they may have been simply coming to Jesus to see him do these amazing things. But we don't know. We can't know. The thing is, is even today, there are many people who hang around Jesus or hang around the church. And they come to church, they come to Jesus for what they can get out of it, for the benefits. Now, don't get me wrong, there are great benefits that you get from Jesus. But there are many people who are just there for what they can get out of Jesus rather than following Jesus. Because there is so much more. Following Jesus is so much more than what I can get. Following Jesus is knowing him, is loving him, submitting to him, being committed to him, and becoming like him through spending that time with him. Which brings us to the next group, the in crowd. Look at verse 13 through 19. It says, And he went up on the mountain and called to him those whom he desired, and they came to him. And he appointed twelve, whom he also named apostles, so that they might be with him, and he might send them out to preach. And have authority to cast out demons. He appointed the twelve, Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, to whom he gave the name Boanerges, that is, sons of thunder. Andrew, and Philip, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas, and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, and Simon the zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. So here we are, we're given the names of the twelve disciples, or twelve apostles. And he mentions the first one is Simon, who Simon is the one who Jesus gave the name Peter, which means rock. 
And so he renamed Peter or Simon as Peter or Rock. And now this is very similar to in the Old Testament when God renamed Abraham. He renamed Abram, Abraham. He renamed Jacob, Israel. And when he did that, and when Jesus did this for Peter, it indicated that he had a new, a new, uh, a, a, a new, uh, wow, a new purpose in life. A new stage of life was in front of him. And so he says here, he gives them a name, meaning you have a brand new purpose, Peter. And Peter, he became the leader of the 12 disciples, of the 12 apostles, and the leader of the early church. And then we also hear about James and John, and they were called the sons of thunder, and I can only imagine why they were called sons of thunder. I mean, I wonder sometimes, was it, were they easily angered? Were they very excitable? Were they just loud or what? I don't know, but they were sons of thunder. Oh, what a cool name. Anyways, but, uh, uh, anyways, but they're, they're sons of thunder. And, 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 but the rest of the disciples, he just simply lists off until you get to Judas. And Judas is named as specifically the one who would betray him. You see, Judas had this extra statement about him because Jesus, he was close to Jesus, but he wasn't really in. He didn't really believe. He wasn't really following Jesus. He was there. He was close. But he wasn't really part of the group that was in and truly believing and following Jesus. The thing is that other than Judas, these apostles became an example of what it meant to follow Jesus. And so I want you to notice what it says about them. It says that he called them. He called those he desired and what happened? They came. He called them and they came. That's how it's done. Jesus calls and we come. We follow. You see, Jesus chose those men and appointed them as apostles. Now, apostle means sent one, someone who he is going to commission, and he's going to be their, his commissioned representatives. But why did he choose them and appoint them? Well, it tells us to be with him and to send them out. See, and before he sent them out, they needed to be with him. They needed to be with him in order to be close to him, to watch him and learn from him, to know him, to imitate him, and then to be sent. And when they were sent, then they would go out and they would continue Jesus' mission and they would do what Jesus did the way Jesus did it. You see, so they spend time with Jesus to become like him, and then they go out and do, continue his mission the way he would do it. So you be with, and you go out. And see, there, again, they're our example of what it means to be on the inside. To what it means to be a follower of Jesus, to be in with Jesus. First, you be with him. You learn from him, you grow, you become like him. And then being with, after being with him, you go out. And the thing is, is we've already been sent. We know the commission. Go into all the world and make disciples. So we're with him. We spend time with him. We get to know him. We grow. We become more like him. And then we go out. And we go as his representatives and we continue his work like he would do it. That means we love people, we help people, we boldly speak the truth without compromise. But the thing is, we need both of those things. We don't go out and boldly speak the truth without, without compromise, but also without love, without caring for people, without helping people. We go out the way Jesus did. We love people, we care for people, we help people, and we speak the truth without compromise. If you lose either one of them, you're not doing it the way Jesus did it. Well, at this point, Mark tells us about a third group. And this group is the outsiders. And when I say that, I'm not using this in a derogatory fashion at all. I'm not saying it's like, oh, well, they're those ones who are out there. They're not part of us. They're not as cool as us. They're not as special as us. They're not as important as us. 
That's not what I'm doing at all. I'm simply saying they are not connected with Jesus. And so there's no arrogance in this term. There's actually a, a, a bit of sorrow, sadness, that they're out. They haven't yet believed in Jesus. They haven't yet come in. But in these, in these verses, what we see here is there are actually two different groups of outsiders. One is moderately opposed to Jesus. And like I said earlier, they're not really sure what to think about Jesus. They're not really sure how to approach him, what to think about what he's doing. But the other group has just completely rejected him. And we start here by hearing about the first group, and then that group, that, that story is interrupted by the, the story of the second group. And then we get back to the first group at the end. Let's read in verse 20 and 21. It says, Then he went home, and the crowd gathered again, so that they could not even eat. And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him, for they were saying, He is out of his mind. So it says he went home. Again, this is probably talking about Peter's home uh, in Caper uh, Capernaum, where he had been before. But we're told that the crowd again comes to him. So they find out he's there and they all come to the house. But it says that they won't leave him alone. It seems like he's trying to eat, but he can't. It says he can't even eat because of the crowd. They won't leave him alone. Well, Jesus' family hears about this. And in, in my version, it says family. In, many, in the King James, it says his, his uh, friends. In the New King James and the New American Standard, it says his own people. The term there, really, it's a general term that, that refers to uh, just the, literally means ones from him. So those who are associated with him. So, so there's been some confusion over this. And, and the thing is, is in that time period, there are other writings that we can find in, in the Greek that are not from, not in the Bible, but other writings, just common writings that people, uh, you know, like even like letters or shopping lists and things like that. And they would use this term to refer to their household or their family. Not only that, when we look at the context of this passage, we know it can't be his associates, meaning his disciples, because where are his disciples? They're in the house with him. So they can't go out to get him. So this is someone who's not with him, who's coming to find him, to get him. All right? And so, so we have this here, and his, his family. The other thing is that later on, uh, later on uh, if, at the end of the section, we are specifically told that his mother and brothers are out there looking for him. And, uh, and, uh, but what's it say here about these people, about his family? It says that they heard it, so they heard what was happening, and they came to seize him, and they thought he was out of his mind. Now, this word seize literally means seize. They were coming to restrain him, to take charge of him. This word was used when you would arrest someone. So you were no longer allowing them freedom to do whatever they want to do. You are taking control over them. This is what they want to do. They want to come and take charge over Jesus, to physically take him away. Now, but why? Why? Well, I think it's because they heard what was happening. It says they heard it. Well, we were just told what's happening. They heard what was happening and they think he's crazy. Well, they don't really understand what Jesus is doing. But their assessment of the situation ties in back to that statement that he was not able to eat. And so they're looking at Jesus saying, he's not even taking care of himself. Look what he's doing. He's so busy doing this and that, that he's not, he's not taking care of his basic needs. He's not, well, we know it looks like he was trying, but he's, the crowds are, but, but anyways, but they look and they say, he's not even taking care of himself. You've got to be crazy not to do that. And maybe they're thinking he's chasing fame. You know, these people are coming to him and he's like so excited about these people coming that he's ignoring his own needs and, and, and chasing this fame. But whatever it is, they're looking at him and they're saying, what he's doing is crazy. He's out of his mind. He's out of control. And so they're coming to stop him from doing what he's doing. And from their view, they're coming to stop him for his own good. They may also be coming to stop him for the good of the family or the reputation of the family. But they are coming to stop him. But we see here that they don't believe in Jesus. They don't believe in what he's doing or what he's teaching. They are not following Jesus. And they don't until after he dies and rises from the grave and appears to them. 
And at that time, his family believes in Jesus and follows him. Well, so we're told that the family is coming to, to seize him because they think he's crazy. But while the family is headed over there to get Jesus, some other people show up. Look at verse 22 through 30. It says, And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, He is possessed by Beelzebub. That's another name for Satan. He is possessed by Beelzebub, and by the prince of demons he casts out the demons. And he called them to him and said to them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but is coming to an end. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man. Then indeed he may plunder his house. Truly I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the children of man and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they were saying he has an unclean spirit. So here we hear about these scribes, and scribes, if we remember, are experts in the Old Testament law. And we've heard about the scribes before, we've seen some of these scribes before, but these scribes are different because these are scribes who are from Jerusalem. So Jesus' reputation has grown so much that the people in the heart of Judaism in Jerusalem have heard about him. He is so popular and so famous that the, that the leaders in Jerusalem, the center of Jerusalem, have decided that they have to do something about him. They've got to do something to stop the spread of his fame. They've got to do something. And what they have decided to do, because they have, is, is to go and confront him and to ruin his reputation. The thing is, is being from Jerusalem, they would actually carry some clout. They would have some influence and they could very easily sway opinion because they would be respected. But see, they have rejected the idea that Jesus is from God and they want to stop him and stop his message. Now, here's the problem. Everybody knew that Jesus was casting out demons. It was a fact. They knew it because there were so many eyewitnesses and everyone's talking about it. Jesus does this. He tells them and they go. So everybody knew that he was doing this. And when he does it, it's easy. It's instantaneous. He has total authority over them. So Jesus has undeniable supernatural power. So what are you going to say about him? Well, you could go to a natural conclusion that Jesus has this power, and that power is from God, therefore Jesus is from God. And the coming of Jesus marks the beginning of the decline of Satan's power in the world. But that's not where they go. You see, they bring the propaganda conclusion. And they start saying, well, okay, it's obvious he has this power and this authority, but his power is from Satan, not from God. They say, Jesus is not good, but he's evil. Wait a minute, but what is, all, what is Jesus doing? He's doing good. He's helping people. He's healing people. He's freeing people from bondage to these demons. But what they're saying is he's not good. He's evil. His power is not from God. It's from Satan. Not only that, they say Jesus is possessed himself. And the idea is that he just has a, maybe a, a, a higher up demon that's possessing him. And he has more authority. So he can cast out those lower ones and say, get, get walking. And so he's doing it by the power of Satan, the authority of Satan. The thing is, these people have nothing to support their claim. But notice what they're doing in verse 22. It says, they were saying. This means, this is not, uh, this is not something they just said one time. This is something they're repeating. So this is an ongoing smear campaign against Jesus. And they're going around and telling people, oh, yeah, I know you know about Jesus, but he's not good. He's not from God. He's from Satan. That power he has, it's not from God. So it's an ongoing smear campaign. They were saying this about Jesus. Now, the thing is, Jesus sees them and he calls them over and he refutes their claims. And, and he just shows he shows just how illogical their arguments are. And he starts with a question. 
He simply says, how can Satan cast out Satan? In other words, it doesn't make sense. Why would Satan undo his own work? And then he uses these illustrations or parables to make his argument. First of all, he says, if a kingdom divided, divided against itself won't stand. We understand that. If you have an army and the army is supposed to uh, uh, protect a kingdom and that army decides they don't like each other and half of them, half they split up and they start fighting each other, what's going to happen to that army? They're going to destroy themselves and then what happens to the kingdom? Easy prey. So a kingdom divided can't stand. Secondly, he says a house divided won't stand. Think this about a royal family. And in this royal family, you have one guy who's the king, and then you have all these other guys who want to be king. And they think, I would be a better king than Joe. And so, I don't know any kings named Joe, but anyways, but I would be a better king than Joe. And this says, well, I would be a better king than you. And they start bickering amongst themselves, and they want to, all want to be in charge. And then what happens? Well, those bickering turns to bigger and bigger problems. They're, they turn into divisions. There's distrust amongst everyone. And then there's revolt and there's maybe assassinations. A family divided cannot stand. And so Jesus is making this point. So if Satan was fighting himself, he would fall. He would have no strength. But the thing is, is, we obviously know he does have strength because look at all the people who are possessed who Jesus is casting demons out of. So G Satan is going out and he was powerful and he was possessing people and Jesus is undoing some of his work. But he says if Satan was undoing his own work, he would fall and he wouldn't be strong. But we see that he is. So Jesus uses a third illustration about the strong man. He says you can't break into a home that's guarded by a strong man. In other words, there's a strong guy who's protecting his house. He's standing guard and watching out to make sure nobody gets in. You're not going to get in. Unless you're a stronger man and you can overpower him. And then if you can overpower that strong man, then you can get in and take his stuff. And Jesus is saying that he's the stronger man. He says he can overpower Satan because he's stronger. He can cast out demons because he's stronger. And so that's what he's saying about himself. Saying that Satan has the kingdom and he's strong. But Jesus is stronger. And he pass, he, he, he's able to do this because he's doing it by the power of God. And he's stronger. So they accuse Jesus of casting out demons by the power of Satan. But now Jesus brings a charge against them. And in the very least, this is a warning to them. And it starts with the words, I tell you the truth. Now this is an interesting statement because you know what? Jesus always tells the truth. But he says it here, I tell you the truth to bring emphasis to it. He says, listen to this. I'm telling you something that's true. You need to hear this. He says, you're doing something that's unforgivable. And he goes on and talks about blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Now this whole idea of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is a difficult concept. And it has caused much confusion uh, uh, throughout the years. But I think to fully grasp what it means, we need to look at how it's used in all three Gospels where it appears. So it appears in Mark. It also appears in Matthew and in Luke. In all three Gospels, it's there. So let me show you how it's where. In Mark, here in these verses, Mark 28 to 30, 3, 28 to 30, is connected with this story about this charge against Jesus of casting out demons in the power, from the power of Beelzebub. So it's connected with the Beelzebub charge, where they are tr attributing the work of the Holy Spirit to Satan. That's basically the problem here. They're saying that Jesus is doing something with, that he's doing through the power of the Holy Spirit, but he's actually doing, they're saying he's doing it through the power of Satan. So they're attributing the work of the Holy Spirit to Satan. And so here, what, this idea, it would suggest that what this is referring to is an attitude or a settled belief, a conviction that rejects the work of Jesus as being from God. Let me say that again, because I saw some of you writing that down. It refers to an attitude or a settled belief or a conviction that rejects the work of Jesus as being from God. In Matthew chapter 12, verses 31 to 32, it is again connected with this Beelzebub charge that they bring him, that he's doing this through the power of Beelzebub. 
However, immediately preceding this statement where he talks about blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is the statement where he says that whoever is not with me is against me. And so when Matthew seems more to be referring to not believing in Jesus and aligning yourself with Jesus. And then in Luke, it's connected with a different story. We're given the statement, but it's connected with the idea of denying Jesus because of fear of people. And it's in Luke 12, 10. But you're denying Jesus because you fear people. And so it refers to not fearing God and therefore not believing in Jesus. So we take all these three things together and all of these ideas is the, or all these uh, uh, gospels is the idea of rejecting or not believing in Jesus. Here's the thing. We know from the rest of scripture, as we read the New Testament, we know that if you believe in Jesus, the Holy Spirit has led you to do that. The Holy Spirit has convicted your heart. The Holy Spirit has led you to believe in Jesus. And so the issue here is how are you responding to the Spirit's leading or the Spirit's work in your heart? So we're not talking about just a one-time comment that somebody made or a one-time thought that someone had, but a total rejection of Jesus and His saving work. It's talking about a hardened rejection of the Spirit's call and leading in your life to believe in Jesus. So when your heart is so hardened towards God that you permanently refuse, refuse to listen to the Holy Spirit, there's no forgiveness for you. Why? Because if you won't listen to the Spirit, you won't believe in Jesus. And Jesus is the only way to be forgiven and saved from your sins. But here's the kicker of all this. We don't know when or if this has happened in someone's heart. God knows, but we don't know. So that means if you are someone who is afraid that you've done this, and I've had people call me before and say, I'm afraid I've blasphemed the Holy Spirit. But if you're actually concerned that you've done it, I'm going to take a wild guess that you haven't done it. Because you are concerned that you have not listen to the Spirit. And that means you have not totally and completely rejected Him and cut, off, cut Him off and not listening. The second thing is we don't know who else has already done this. So that means we don't go around and say, well, that person will never accept Jesus because they're too far away. They, they've obviously not listened to the Spirit. All we can do is pray and continue to share the Gospel. Do what we're supposed to do. Pray and share the Gospel. So, as Jesus is f finishing correcting his accusers, his family shows up outside. And of course, they can't get in because the crowd is all there at the house. Look at verse 31 through 33. It says, And his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. And a crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. And he answered them, Who are my mother and my brothers? So they tell Jesus, Your family's out there. Your mother and your brothers are looking for you. And he seems to not be too concerned about it. Uh, I think it's because he knows why they're there. They're there to stop him. They're there to stop him from continuing his ministry. But he asks this question, who are my, brother, my mother and my brothers? And it almost sounds like he doesn't care about them. But I don't think that's really what Jesus is doing here. I don't think he's putting down his family or the relationship he has with his family. But he's decided he's going to use this as an opportunity to highlight the importance of the relationship between Jesus and believers. Between Jesus and his followers. Because look what he says. He says their family. Look at verse 34 and 35. And looking about at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. 
He says, this is my family. Those who are, are true believers, those who are follower, true followers of God. He says, those who do, do the will of God. And in this instance, I, what Jesus is talking about, I believe, is, is those who truly follow Jesus, who believe in him, because that is the will of God. So those who believe in Jesus and are following his teaching. But why don't you notice one other thing? He says, who are my mother and my brothers? The people said, your mother and your brothers are outside. But Jesus, at the very end, he says, these are my mother, or excuse me, my brothers and my sisters and my mother. And I think Jesus is making a point here to include all the ladies. He's saying this isn't just for men. But this is for everyone who does the will of God. This is for everyone who is following Jesus. But that means that every true believer has a deep, intimate bond with Jesus. They have a special relationship. But this special relationship also implies that your bond between Jesus and even their, your bond with other believers is closer uh, or deeper than the bond with your own physical family if they are not also believers. It also implies that you may get opposition sometimes from your family. In fact, they may, I mean, just like Jesus did, and they may think you're crazy. And they may try and stop you from believing in Jesus or stop you from following Jesus. But hey, it means you're family and you're in with Jesus. But see, in this passage that we looked at today, in all these sections, we find an encouragement and we find challenge. First of all, the encouragement. If you believe in Jesus, if you have trusted in him as your savior, you know what that means? That means your family. You're in. Your family. And you know, that is an awesome thing to think about. It is an awesome privilege. That means you are forever related to Jesus, the son of God, the one who has all authority and all power, the one who loves you. You are forever related to to Jesus. That also means that we're family. If you are a believer in Jesus, and I'm a believer in Jesus, and he's a believer, and she's a believer in Jesus, we're family. And that means that we have people to help us. We have people to come alongside of us. We have people to encourage us, to spur us on to do what is right, to be obedient, to be like Jesus. We have help, because we're family. And here's the challenge. There's actually two of them. First one, if you believe in Jesus, you're in. But that means that he has called you to be with him, to learn from him, and to follow him, and to go. You see, being with Jesus is not like being in some kind of exclusive club where we're like, oh good, I'm glad I got in. And we think, well, now I don't have to mess around with those people out there. Being with Jesus, that's, being with Jesus is actually kind of the opposite of that. We, we get in to be with Jesus. That means that we love like him. We go out like him. We help people like he did. We take the message like he did. And we try to get as many people as we can in with us. You see, we've been called. We've been called to be with Jesus and to be sent out to those who do not yet know Jesus as their Savior. And the second challenge is this. You're either in or you're out. But the thing is, is you were created to be in. You were created to be in, to have a relationship with God. And the only way you can have that relationship with God is through Jesus. We, every one of us, was created to have that relationship with God. But our disobedience of God, our sin, separates us from God. Cuts us off from Him and destined us for judgment. But God wasn't good with that. He says, I'm going to send my son 
to take the punishment upon himself so you could be free and forgiven and come to know me and be my children. So Jesus came and he lived a sinless life and he died a death he did not deserve in order to take our punishment upon himself so that we could be forgiven, so that we could be set free, so that we could be made the children of God, so that we could follow Jesus. And everyone who believes in Jesus is forgiven, is made a child of God, is in. And if you believe, you'll be forgiven, your life will be changed, and you will have the privilege of following Jesus and being with Jesus. You'll be in, just like you were meant to be. So believe in Jesus and get in. <laughs>